This morning, uh, we are beginning a new series uh, that's going to last throughout the month of January uh, and, that I've entitled Stretching Your Faith. Um, I believe probably most in here would say that we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, if not, we'll talk about that this morning. And But um, I believe that are we allowing, are we trusting in God to let him do everything that he, that he can do and wants to do in our lives? Uh, you know, as we remember what Christ has done for us on the cross as we've celebrated um, the Lord's Supper together, the forgiveness and mercy that we have through him uh, provides a a wonderful foundation for new beginnings. Amen? We heard um, John talk about that as he welcomed us this morning and talking about what a new year represents to us. In reality, friends, this is just another day, right? Just another day. It's not really any different than any of the other 364, except that we turn our calendars to a, a new number, and so it represents newness, the newness of life. Amen? And so um, what I'm here to say this morning is, just as January 1st represents newness of life, what Jesus has given us here represents newness of life. Amen? It represents newness of life. And so um, I, I want to talk to you about that this morning because God's mercy is new every single morning. And there are some of you here today, some of you watching us online, that need to experience a fresh new beginning in the Lord. Maybe that's you need to put your faith and trust in him for the very first time. Maybe it's in a situation that you're in that just, just is difficult. And you need to experience God's new mercies today. Um, I want to share with you some... You know, there are many situations in which people are longing for God to do something new in their lives. There's the, there's, and, and maybe you can identify with some of these. There's the woman whose heart is broken because her, she found out her husband has been cheating on her. And she can't get past that experience. Understandable, right? And she says, I'm never going to let that happen to me again. I'm never going to trust another human being like that again. You know what she needs? She needs to experience the freshness and the newness of Christ in her life that will allow her to get past that. There, there are the two brothers who've not spoken to each other in 10 years because a business that they built together failed. And they blame each other for what went wrong. They need to experience the newness of the Lord. They need God to do a new work in their lives so they can forgive each other and move on. There's the, there's the young man who has not visited nor spoken to his mother and father in 10 years because of what he views as an abusive childhood. And, and he cannot bring himself to forgive his parents, forget the past, and move on. He needs God to do a new work in him. Friends, we could go on and on and on and name countless others from those who are struggling in love-starved marriages to those who, who've lost a passion for their work, to those who are just trying to find meaning and purpose in life. These are just a few examples of situations in which people are longing for God to do something new in their lives. Can I give you a little secret? Friends, I believe the Lord wants to do something new in our lives. Amen? I believe the Lord Jesus wants to do a new work in our lives. It is a matter of will we let him do what he wants to do. Um, this morning, we're going to be uh, looking at a story in the Gospel of Mark in which a man not only wanted or wished or longed for God to do something, but um, he kind of took the bull by the horns. Uh, he actually sought it out and pursued it. I, I think... You know, as Baptists, we believe in the sovereignty of God. Amen? We believe fully in the sovereignty of God. We have God's in control um, and, and, and everything that goes with that. 
I think sometimes because of that, we kind of sit back and wait for things to happen to us instead of taking initiative in pursuing the Lord. Um, listen, everything I say this morning is under the caveat of we fully believe in the sovereignty of God, okay? God is a God. Uh, listen, he knows, he knows the, the past from the present. He knows everything that's going to happen, amen? He preordained and pre, predestined those uh, who would trust in Christ to, to, to live eternally with him. But friends, um, I believe there are some things, I believe we see it in our passage today, some ways in which we can bring the new into our lives. Some behaviors that we need to make sure, I believe, are in our lives in order to facilitate um, allowing God to do a new work in us in 2023. So if you got your outline, I don't know if you picked one up when you came in this morning, but uh, if not, just, uh, you know what, um, grab a napkin or a... Uh, whatever, I don't know, and, and, and just take some notes. So number one, uh, how can we bring the new into our lives? How can we facilitate bringing the new into our lives in 2023? I think first of all, friends, it begins with an attitude of acknowledging the Lord Jesus as the one who can make all things new. I believe it begins just with acknowledging that he is the one who can make things new. See, oftentimes when we think, when we get to January 1 and we think about a new start, what do we do? We make resolutions, right? We write down what we want to do different in the new year. And nothing wrong with that. If you've done that already or if you plan to do that, I would encourage you to do that, okay? We think about what we need to do. We think about what we need to do better. We think about what we need to do more often. Or we think about what we need to do with a better plan. But, friends, what we need to realize is, I believe, if something new is genuinely going to happen, and if there's really going to be a true change in our lives, friends, then it's not going to be us that does that. It's not going to be a better plan. It's not going to be a fresh approach, friends. If we're going to get the new that we're really looking for, we need to allow the Lord Jesus to do a work in our heart. And I believe that's where we often fall short. In our text today, um, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem uh, for the very last time, okay? So this is, if you look in context here, it is in, is right before the triumphal entry. Um, we don't know time-wise exactly how much time passed and took place, but Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He is stopped over in Jericho. And so in verse 46, it, it says this. It says, Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his, with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. Now, this was not an unusual occurrence to find a beggar on the side of the road. It was a common thing in Jesus' day. Those who were... Um, had some kind of a malady. Those who were handicapped often sat by the road begging. That's how they um, supported themselves and how they provided for themselves. And so that's why um, the Jews were encouraged to give alms and to give to those who were there. And while we're encouraged often to give. Um, and so uh, this was not a, an uncommon occurrence. In fact, Luke tells us that there were actually two beggars there. And I think that brings the question, why then did Mark just mention one, Bartimaeus, and why did he mention him by name? And we really don't know the answer to that. Um, I would probably think somebody has, has, has kind of um, suggested that maybe the reason Bartimaeus is mentioned here is because the audience that Mark was writing to in the new church, they knew who he was personally. Maybe, could it be that Bartimaeus had become an integral part of the New Testament church? As we see what's going to happen here to him, I think that's very likely. We don't know. Maybe. Nevertheless, Bartimaeus is on by the road begging. Jesus is walking by. A great crowd is with him. Verse 47, and when he, Bartimaeus, heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. Now, remember, he's blind. He's sitting by the road. How does he know Jesus is coming by? 
We get a little glimpse of that from Luke and so forth. The crowd was making a big ruckus and so forth. And as you can imagine, lots of people gather around because they hear Jesus is, 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 is around. And um, I'm sure Bartimaeus heard the crowd. He heard the commotion. Probably asked somebody, hey, what's going on? Who is it? What, 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 what's happening? And somebody tells him, Jesus is walking by. Now, Bartimaeus, no doubt, had heard about Jesus. Um, everybody by this time had heard about Jesus. Um, they'd heard about his miracle, um, miracle working power. They'd heard about all the signs, all the wonders, and so forth. And, but evidently, Bartimaeus not only had heard about it, um, I believe Bartimaeus believed. Because look at what he did. Verse 47, he says, when he heard that it was that Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. He knew it was a large crowd. He knew he was going to have to make a lot of noise he said, and, and, and say, what did he say? He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 48 says, then many warned him to be quiet. So they tried to shush him, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, he could have just called him by his name, right? Jesus! Jesus! That's not what he did. He called he said, Jesus, but he added another phrase, what, son of David. Now, that's not just another name for Jesus. It's a, a title, if you will, right? It's, a, it's significant because it's not just any title. It's a messianic title. I believe in and of itself that phrase by son of David signifies an expression of Bartimaeus' faith. I believe it signifies that he believed Jesus was more than just an itinerant preacher. He was more than just a, a, a guy who went around and did, did miracles. I believe it signified that he believed Jesus was the Messiah. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we are told that the Messiah, uh, David actually is told that the Messiah will be what will be one of his descendants it will be his his one of his sons grandsons right on down the line it will be the heir to the throne and will fulfill uh, as the son of david will fulfill all the promises to abraham and to david as well so bartimaeus calling jesus the son of david was more than just calling him another name it is an acknowledgement that Jesus was more than just a prophet. He was more than just a teacher. He was more than just a traveling rabbi. I believe it's Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus declaring that he believed Jesus was and still is the promised one of Israel. And I believe in calling him this, it is acknowledging that Jesus is the one who can do what nobody else could do for him could heal him. Amen? Listen, um, if, we, if we want new in our lives, and we want new that's going to last, we need to look to Jesus and not other things. Amen? You know, many people in our day, instead of looking to Jesus to make them new, they look to other things to make them new. Um, many people look to a pill or to a procedure to make them new. They think this is going to make them whole. Uh, many because they believe, in, um, the, the, they believe in modern science, they believe in medicine, they believe that, that they can make changes to their own life that will make them feel whole and, and, and good and new. Um, they believe that that's where they'll find the answers. Friends, that's not where we'll find the answers. We'll only find the answers in Jesus. Many look to a, a new method or a methodology, right? They say, oh, wow, I can, I, I, I'm learning this something new. They believe that given time for research and discovery, we as human beings, mankind, can discover and figure things out which will help us to make us new and better. Those things aren't where the real answers are found. Many people look to hard work and determination, and believe that self-help is the answer. Friends, I believe what we see here and, and what we really need to understand is that only Jesus can give us the, the new that we're really looking for. 
Only the Lord Jesus and his word have the answer to our deepest needs and problems. And friends, even though God oftentimes uses human beings, amen? Listen, uh, Pastor Brand is a perfect example. God uses modern medicine, right, and works through that in a lot of different ways. But that doctor, that research scientist, that inventor is not the answer. God is the answer. He's the one who gives us as human beings the, the ability to find out how to do all of these wonderful things, things that, that I have no idea how to do. But God has gifted human beings to do that. Uh, but friends, we need to understand that we look to God and not to all of these worldly things for our answers. If we are going to truly find the newness that we're looking for, it has to be in the Lord and not all these other things. Leads us to number two. How, do we bring, how can we bring the new into our lives? I believe we first must acknowledge that Jesus is the one who can make us new. Second of all, very simply, flowing out of that, we need to trust completely in his ability to do that. Whatever that new is that we need. Whatever that new is we're looking for. Friends, um, what's going to change your situation? What's going to give you a new, different perspective? What's going to bring about a new whatever? Is it just turning over a new leaf? Is it making a new determination? Friends, uh, I don't believe so. Whether the new that you're looking for is a new marriage, it's a new outlook, it's a new mindset, a new passion, a new vision, a new spiritual vigor. Friends, only Jesus can bring about the new that we really need. In verse 47, we see Bartimaeus crying out for Jesus. And look at what he says. We saw the, how he called Jesus. Jesus, son of David. But what, is, what does he say there? He says, he began to cry and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Verse 48 says, they, then they tried to shush him, right? Many warned him to be quiet. Be quiet. Don't bother him, right? But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Friends, what is Bartimaeus doing? He is begging the Lord in a very public setting to have pity and compassion on him, to notice him and to do something for him that, um, that, that, that he had longed for, for probably for a long time, to hear him, to recognize him. He's, he's calling out, Jesus, help me. I want you to think about this. Um, think about the, the, the humility that that took. Listen, this had to be a man who had had all of his pride ripped away. You know, sometimes I think we feel, I don't think, uh, we feel sorry for, for, for those oftentimes who um, have um, a, a malady or a handicap in our world. And probably rightfully so. Um, why does God allow those things? You know what? Can we all just admit something? Um, we all have handicaps. Some of them are, and I'm, some of them are visible and some of them are not. Okay. And we spend a lot of time in our lives trying to hide those handicaps and trying to hide our insufficiencies and trying to hide our shortcomings. And Bartimaeus just couldn't hide his. He was blind. And so all of his pride had been ripped away. And, and that led him to a willingness to admit his need. It was obvious, right? Ours is just not obvious. It led him to a place where he had to admit his need and, and his inability to help himself. That he was both helpless and hopeless. And guess what it did? It drove him to his knees. Friends, God will allow things to happen in your life that oftentimes make people mad and make people mad at God, but is meant to draw people to him. And God allows things in our lives oftentimes to break down our pride and to bring us to a point where we are willing to admit our need for him. Men, this is especially hard for us. 
because we don't like to think that we need help from anybody. In fact, so much so that um, we won't even oftentimes ask a friend to come over and help us because we just want to do it ourselves. One of the hardest things, because one of the hardest things for us to do is to admit our own need and our faults. Amen? That's exactly what we need to do. Listen, when was the last time, look at what Bart- Bartimaeus cried out to Jesus. When was the last time you saw a, a, a grown man cry out for anybody? Right? Now, holler, yes, but, you know, crying out, Jesus, help me. Probably never. But that's exactly what Bartimaeus did. One of the hardest things for us to do is admit our faults, admit our need. You know, um, if it's if it's marriage renewal that we need, instead of saying, you know what, I need to change, we often point our finger at the other person, right? It's, it's their fault that my marriage is the way it is. It's not mine. It's always the other person's fault. If the renewal we need is job-related, it's often, we say it's the company's fault, right? Or it's, it's, it's my coworkers. They, if, if I didn't have terrible coworkers, I'd be able to do a better job, right? Or it's my boss's fault, or it's the environment. If I was in a better environment, I'd be able to do a better job. If it's health-related, it's because of stress, if it's, if it's school-related, it's because of the teacher. If it's personal, we want to claim some syndrome or some disease to put the blame on and, and because it absolves us of personal fault. Friends, sometimes I believe we have to get to the end of our rope so that we'll admit our need, so that we'll admit our faults. Blind Bartimaeus knew he needed help. It was obvious He was blind. He had to rely on others. He'd been relegated to begging all of his life. But more than that, he knew he didn't deserve anything from Jesus. Bartimaeus' blindness carried with it a stigma. You know, elsewhere, Jesus, it it was a wrong stigma because Jesus corrected it. Remember um, when the, the, the disciples, they passed by and said, why was this guy blind? Um, who sinned, he, he or his parents? Uh, Jewish theology taught that maladies like that were because of, of some sin. And so Bartimaeus, probably if he'd been blind from birth, we don't know that or not, but pro- maybe all of his life had been thinking, what have I done to deserve this? What have I done? And he'd been chewing on that. And so Blind Bartimaeus asking for mercy, I believe, was both an acknowledgement of his physical need, but also a spiritual need as well. He knew he was in need on both fronts. Friends, where does that bring us? If we want to be made new, if, if we want our marriages to be made new, if we want our relationships to be made new, if we want a new passion and vigor for life, if we want our peace and our joy and our hope to be renewed, then we must come to the same place and we must admit that we have a need. Lord, I can't do this on my own. Lord, I, I, I've messed up. Whatever it is, we must come to that place and willing, similar to Bartimaeus, say, Lord, have mercy on me. A sinner. The question is, are you there yet? What are you longing for God to do new in your life? Don't come to God and say, God, I deserve this. That won't get you anywhere. God, you got to do this in my life. Maybe we've got to have the right heart of just saying, Lord, it's my fault I'm where I am. Listen. You know, in any situation, um, the fault, even in, a, even in a broken marriage where there's one person that's done something um, vastly wrong, there's usually, most always, at least some fault on both sides. What fault, in whatever situation it is, is yours, and own that. Acknowledge that Jesus is the one that, you, that can give you what, 
is the only one who can, who can do a new thing in your life. Friends, trust and believe in his ability to do it. And I believe the third thing that we see in our text today, and this is kind of the initiative part, this is the part that we need to ask. We need to ask, friends, don't be afraid. Listen, if you're longing for God to do something new in your life, friends, don't be afraid to ask God for what you might think is a miracle in your life. Maybe it's something you've been struggling with for years. Maybe it's a relationship that's been messed up for years, that's been awkward. Maybe it's a relationship with somebody in your family that, or, or, or somebody at work that you know is not, and it's, you just, you've given up on it. Okay, whatever. And you literally would say, listen, it's going to be a miracle if this is going to happen. Friends, don't be afraid to ask God for that miracle, to trust in his strength and his power to provide it. As Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Friends, whatever situation you're in where you are longing for God to do a new thing, whether it's spiritual renewal that you need or whether it's in your marriage or whether it's renewal in some relationship or you just you need God to do a new thing with a hurt that you've had and you've been holding on to for a long time or maybe you just need God to revive your outlook, friends. Don't be afraid to ask God to do a new work in your life, to do something new. I always think of the persistent widow, you know, I think oftentimes we think, you know what, I pray, God hears me, we know he does, right? He, God even knows our prayers before we say them, right? That's, as Baptists, that, you know, of course, yes. And so we pray and, and we let God know and then we kind of say, okay, God knows it, I'm going to go about. And there's, there is some, some faith and trust in that and so forth, but I believe what the scripture teaches us is we need, it's okay to be persistent. Uh, it's okay to to dare I say it, bug God? Um, look at verse 47. Bartimaeus had been, had been calling out for Jesus, right? He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David. Then in verse 48, which we've already looked at, they tried to shush him, right? And what did he do? He cried out all the more, right? He didn't be quiet. Not at all. He kept crying. Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49 tells us, so Jesus stood, stood still. I can only imagine how loud he must have been. Or it may just have been, listen, Jesus knew. Amen. Jesus knew. Above all the crowds, he knew that he was going to have this opportunity. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Hey, who's that guy? Call him over here. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Um, Luke, I believe it is, um, Matthew or Luke, one of them, I believe, says that they, they brought him to Jesus. So here Bartimaeus throws off his cloak, uh, gets up, starts running. Remember, he's blind. He doesn't know exactly where Jesus is at, right? So I believe he takes initiative. They kind of come along and probably lead him to Jesus and and. You know, Bart, Bart, Bartimaeus could have froze, right? Here he is calling out, calling out, calling out. What was the likelihood he believed that Jesus was actually going to hear him and say, bring him to me? Um, I, I don't know. Bartimaeus could have chickened out though, right? He could have thought, you know what? I've been blind all my life. What good is this going to do now? He, he could have thought, you know what? I've been calling out, but... Uh, how many times do we think we want something, but then maybe when we stand up in front of a bunch of people, it's, we freeze, right? But he didn't. He didn't. He took the next step, and he asked Jesus to heal him. Look at verse 51. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him. Now, isn't that interesting? We know Jesus knew, right? He's blind. Okay? Jesus knew. But Jesus gives him an opportunity to vocalize this, to ask, to say this. So Bartimaeus said to him, Rabbi, um, not just rabbi or teacher, it's really a word that means master, master teacher, master, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way, 
your faith has made you well. So um, Bartimaeus could have froze. He didn't. He asked, right? And guess what? Jesus said, yes. He said, yes, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Uh, Literally there it says, um, your faith has saved you. I believe not only was Bartimaeus healed physically, but Jesus also healed him spiritually because of his faith. Why? Because of his faith. Amen? Um, He was healed. Uh, His faith in Christ, his trust in the Lord Jesus healed him. And it says, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. And we don't know for sure, maybe became a part, an integral part of the new church, the New Testament church. Ultimately, what we see here is that Bartimaeus asked, and he did what? He received. You know why most people, I believe, don't experience renewal in their lives? You know why I believe most people don't experience the new that God wants to give them? You know, I believe most people stay stuck where they are, why they never get the new start or the renewal that they're looking for and that they need, because they never ask. Here's the secret. I want you to just, if you've, if you've checked out for all the rest, poke your, poke your neighbor, okay? Um, I want you to hear this, because I believe this is really important. Um, in the, you say, why is it so important for us to ask? We ask, we ask, we ask, whatever. Pastor, I've asked God for a lot of things. Listen, in the asking, there's a submission involved. Okay? The very fact of asking God for something or asking anybody for something for that matter is an admission that we need help. Why do most men not ask others? Because they don't want to admit they need help. Okay, um, the, in the very asking is admitting your need, that you need God's help. And not only is an admission of your need, it's an admission that you believe he can help you. When we ask, I believe it is an act of faith. It is an act of faith that we trust that God is big enough and able to help us. I love Ephesians 3.20. One of my um, seminary professors um, all at the end of every class would quote this verse, and, um, and therefore it kind of has become ingrained in my head. But uh, this is not the whole verse, but as Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ever ask or think. I love, there's three superlatives there, exceedingly, abundantly, above, okay? He's not saying God can do everything we ask. He's saying God can absolutely do everything we ask, and above that, and far beyond that. And so why are we not asking? You say, well, pastor, are you saying that God's like a genie, and we can rub the, rub the lamp any time, and poof, God's going to give us what? No, that's not what I'm saying at all, okay? Um. We need to, as the Lord Jesus, your will be done, not my will, okay? But as we come into alignment with him, we ask him for what we truly need. That's peace in our hearts. It's a new start, amen? It's a renewed relationship. It's a renewed vigor and excitement for life, Friends, I believe God, ask and ye shall receive. He is more than willing to give that, amen, as we submit to him. Friends, if we believe that, then we won't hesitate to ask him, amen? So whatever is going on in your life, wherever you need the new, whatever's going on in your mind, whatever's going on in your heart, in your relationships, in your soul, in your, wherever you need God to do a new work, friends, don't be afraid to ask. Ask him to do it. There's believing in the asking. There's submission in the asking. Ask him to do a new work in your heart today. I want to close with a story um, that I came across this week by, about a man by the name of Paul Myers. 
Um, I don't know, any of you um, remember, okay, this is, for our, this is for the old timers with us today. Any of you remember a radio program called Haven of Rest? Okay, a couple, a couple there. So Paul Myers uh, went on to become first mate Bob, if you know that, that radio show, in, uh, on the longtime radio program Haven of Rest. He shares his story of how he asked God to do a new work in him. He says, one, one winter morning in San Diego, after I'd wandered many miles along the waterfront in a daze, I turned my steps wearily toward my hotel room. He said, I'd been drinking heavily for weeks. My mind was tortured by the thoughts of the wife and four children whom I had deserted. Just yesterday, he says, it seemed I had been a radio executive in charge of two radio stations in Los Angeles. The home in which we lived in Beverly Hills, the cars, the servants, the things that money and social position can provide for a man and his family were just a distant memory. He said, I had dragged my family down with me until they were living in a small little shack, and then I had deserted them. He says, I had suffered from a complete nervous breakdown, and worst of all, I had completely lost my voice. For a year and a half, I had not been able to speak one word aloud. Each effort to talk was just a whisper. The future, he says, I thought held no promise. I opened the door of my hotel room and flung myself into a chair in utter despair. He said, when I did, my gaze fell upon a Gideon Bible on the floor. In a distracted sort of way, he says, I picked it up, opened it, and started to read it. Old familiar words, he said, as he read, I, I learned as a child, words of life, quick and powerful, leaped out of those pages and found their way into my heart. He says, I fell to my knees, spread the Bible upon the chair, and made a vow that I would not leave that hotel room, even if I died of starvation, until there came into my soul a knowledge that my sins had been forgiven, until I knew that I had passed from death unto life. With a surge of joy, he says, I realized that God's promises were even new for men like me. In that hotel room, he says, I found Calvary's cross. There I laid my burden down. There the old man died and a new one was born. From that place, from that moment, he says, I walked in newness of life. I became a new creation, a new creature in Christ and began to praise his name with my life. He goes on to say, God straightened things out between my wife and me. And today, she and I and our four children are back together again. The peace that passes all understanding has loosed the tight nerves and muscles which had prevented me, he says, from normal speech. And God even gave me back my voice. When I finally surrendered to him, God did a new thing in my life. Friends, I believe he can do the same thing in yours. Maybe you're here today, maybe you're watching online, and you need God to do a new thing. You need to surrender your life and your heart to him in salvation. The Bible says, friends, that we are to come unto him, right? All you who labor and are heavy laden, and it says Jesus will give you rest. He will give you peace for your heart. If you will come to him, no matter what's going on in your life, you're saying, but pastor, I don't know. I don't have it in me. You're right. You don't. That's exactly where you need to be. The only thing you're missing if you're there is to say, it's yours, Lord. It's yours. Will you surrender that situation to the Lord in the new year? Some of you need to surrender your whole life. Some of you have a, a marriage that needs to be surrendered to him. Some of you need to have a relationship that you need to surrender to him. Some of you have, have, just have, have, a, have a struggle inside that you need to surrender to him. Whatever it is, friends, this is January 1. We don't often get this opportunity to be here worshiping on January 1. Would you surrender it to him? Ask him to do something new in your heart, in your life, in that situation today. Let's pray.